Welcome back to another edition of Rock Forever. We got a special guest. He is a multitasker. He is the uh, drummer extraordinaire and songwriter, and sometimes, you know, a uh, man about town. Please welcome Brad Elvis. Hi. Hello there, everyone. Hi. Hi, Jay. Hey, Brad. So I know, obviously, we're talking about the handcuffs, and you guys have put out a few albums, but I know some of our viewers and listeners still may be new. We got to bring them up to date because I know you got new, new songs and new great stuff. Um, give us, I, I, I know the background and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, coming up and, you know, being in a band called Screams and of course into the Elvis brothers and you've been drumming for the romantics for a number of years, but tell us about the handcuffs, how that group came together. I know it's a, you know, a, a mixture of male and female artists and voices and all that good stuff. We'd love to hear the, the backstory. How did the handcuffs come together? Well, it all started in a 5,000 watt radio station in Omaha, Nebraska. No, um, let's see, the handcuffs uh, grew out of a band I had called Big Hello that had uh, three albums out uh, independently. And um, and before that, I was had the Elvis Brothers and whoosh, whoosh, going back in time with the calendar. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. But um, so from Big Hello, uh, I had met um, uh, Chloe, uh, and uh, who ended up being my uh, great uh, mus musical teammate and songwriter, and the two of us, and uh, and eventually we got married, and that's it. Thanks. No, uh, and then uh, that was big hello, and then we went through that, and then um, we decided we needed, and I was trying to keep this whole kind of democratic thing going on, but as they always say, that doesn't really work. You got to have leaders and all that stuff. So we were like, you know, we do all the work anyway, so uh, Chloe and I, so we started the handcuffs, and uh, and that was a number of years ago at this point, so here we are uh, getting ready to release our fourth album, and uh it's uh, good stuff, you know, it's rock music, uh, glam, kind of glam, that early 70s glam mixed, uh, seen through a modern lens sort of thing, and uh, people dig it. Yeah, and, uh, what what better influences than T-Rex, Spiders from Mars era, Bowie, and early Blondie? I mean, you know, to update that sound and, and bring it to us, that music is timeless, obviously. T-Rex just got in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year, and... Of course, we still can't get over the, the passing of Bowie. He has such a huge shadow over so much music. <clears throat> and, you know, it's um, pretty exciting when you can blend those those female vocals, you know, with some, you know, androgynous, you know, kind of sound and stuff. You know, I know when you, you grew up in Chicago, right? You're, you're um, actually, I'm more downstate Illinois, kind of middle, middle of the state, the heart of Illinois. Okay. And at what age did you move up to the Windy City? I was in my late 70s. <laughs> no, I wasn't in my late 70s. I moved up here uh, in later, kind of the, the last finalization years of the Elvis Brothers in 1990. So uh, I've lived here quite a while, but, you know, just being in bands basically my entire life, I just had my... Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna age myself. I'm gonna date myself now. How you doing? Nice, great. Um, Fifty. Uh, I had my fiftieth anniversary in June, doing nothing because of the pandemic. But uh, had my fiftieth anniversary of my first gig. So uh, all these many years, uh, played in Chicago a number of times, and uh, it felt like I almost lived here. You know, because it was only a two or three hour drive. And um, so it's a good place to live, Chicago. That's where I'm at, based out of now. But I originally started downstate and played everywhere, you name it, you know. Throw, throw the dart at the board there, so. Yeah, well, second only to the Northeast, you know, there's a, a lot of cities in a, in a clump there with Illinois and Michigan and Ohio and- Iowa, Iowa Indiana, Missouri. And Minnesota, yeah, you know, states. Wisconsin, we're, we're, I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah you know, surrounded. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty uh, pretty um, 
prolific, you know, in the days. And, and I know coming up, um, you, you were kind of involved with the, you know, the, the punk scene, you know, in the, in the seventies is, you know, we came out of that glam era, you know, the Stooges and the MC five and the New York dolls rest in peace, Sylvain, um, you know, all, all these greats were, um, you, you know, coming out with the attitude, like we don't need that three disc, you know, yes album and all the, the, the pomp and circumstance, you know, went out the window. Talk, talk about embracing that, that punk sound, you know, early on and what, what that was like in the Midwest. Yeah, it was, uh, well, one of my early bands, um, the lead dude, you know, I was, you know, being the age of man and uh, growing up in, I was still young in the 60s, but I got it, you know, I, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and it was like, I knew, I knew what I was seeing, you know, it wasn't like, I kind of remember it. No, I, and um, so growing up through all that into the 70s, like most people in rock music goes, oh yeah, you know, they're into the same stuff like you know all the heavy groups like mountain and deep purple and cactus and and of course the beatles and stones and all that and the who that was like my favorite band and uh but into the 70s a bit more uh early 70s uh there was a band leader in one of my early bands he was like there's this guy david bowie and uh he turned us all onto that and then that led us to you know uh, roxy music and uh, the stooges and dolls and all that stuff so like you said uh the glam era is what turned into the punk era and uh and so uh that's where we were coming from so by the mid 70s 75 76 you know uh when punk was first starting to come out as they called it, punk. The Ramones never considered themselves punk. And no one ever considers themselves what they're called <laughs> half the time. But, uh, you know, I got the Ramones right when the first album came out. I was turned on by a friend. And, and the same friend turned me on to the Stooges. I remember going to his, his uh, he still lived with his parents and uh, going to his house, that house one day in his bedroom. And I go, who's this? And he goes, the Stooges, best music to wake up to. <laughs> so, uh, we came from that whole era, and uh, and buying rock, a lot of it helped by uh, the magazine rock scene out of New York. I don't know if you remember that or not. Oh yeah, rock it was, scene. Yeah, rock scene magazine. It was a uh, trouser uh, press and cream and trouser and press. press. Rock scene and trouser press were great. And uh, my education in the Midwest, in the uh, bell bottom blue jean Midwest. And it was like, wow, you're Max's and all these Max's Kansas City and all these band, Wayne it's County like and yeah, and all that stuff. So we were evolved all into that whole that turned into all well, the dolls broke up and Johnny Thunders has this band called the Heartbreakers and and uh, with with this guy named Richard Hell and and uh, then the Ramones and there's this Patty Smith and so yeah, so that all came from that. So my band screams at the time. Uh, we had come out of another band that I had, and we were like, it's time to update and get our seed together. And we really like this cool stuff that we're seeing in these magazines that's happening overseas and on the East Coast. So uh, we switched gears and started doing more of that sort of stuff and writing originals. And uh, that became Screams. And uh, so we were probably the first punk band at least out of uh, Illinois that I know of. And I kept up on all the bands. I, you know, and at the time, Cheap Trick had already started and uh, Paz Band was out there and uh, all those sort of bands. But uh, that's where we were coming from. So I got, I have all these early articles, you know, screams, you know, punk and punk has arrived and all this kind of stuff. But uh, eventually before our album came out a few years later, we had evolved more into it was almost kind of like by the time people started doing the punk stuff in 78, by 77, 78, we were already getting tired of it because we started doing that like in early 76, mid 76. And uh, we had just kind of evolved from seeing like Cheap Trick in the clubs all the time. And that pretty much was like to us, it was like this revelation of, oh, it's like, oh, that's what we're supposed to be doing. You know, they had image, they had great songs presentation they played great and uh so that really 
influenced Screams. So by the time our album came out, uh, our debut album, uh, we were kind of in that vein. We were more of a rock, pop, cheap trick kind of uh, influence. But if you listen to the album, anybody that has that album out there, uh, you can hear other, you can hear hints of Bowie stuff in there, hints of maybe Sex Pistols and, and Eno and all that stuff. All, the who raucous stuff all kind of mixed in with on that album so so that was screams basically now you saw cheap trick before their first album came out oh yeah a couple years yeah i saw them before they had robin singing with them it was a different singer and we had the same booking agency so uh we played a lot of the same venues and clubs and we would hang out and chat and all that stuff yeah, it's absolutely absolutely amazing. You know, Rick Nielsen at his age still still bringing it, uh, always working on new music. It's, you know, it's a uh, it's a wondrous thing. He's a national treasure. But yeah, I mean, Robin Zander, and again, th after this many albums, his voice is as strong, if not stronger. I mean, what 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 can you say about Robin? Well, Robin is you know one of the top you know, I don't know how many, four or five rock singers ever, you know, really. I mean, there's so many good singers out there, but Robin, I mean, he's just one of those gifted, you know, he can sing anything and it's, it sounds like his voice is gonna blow out any second, but nope, keeps going night after night after night and hitting all the high notes. You're just looking at each other going, how's he do it? He just has this gift. He just shows up and sings, you know, and, but there's a, you know, you got the McCartneys and the Little Richards and uh, and uh, and things like that. But yeah, and the, and out touring with the Romantics, you know, we'd play a lot of these uh, uh, '80s type shows, obviously, yeah, yeah. with a lot of the, with a lot of the same artists. And uh, I see a lot of all those bands are actually as uh, good as uh, sorry. Um, as good as they ever were, you know, like, like the Mickey Thomas, you know, oh, yeah. sings great. Uh, what's that? Mike Reno from Loverboy, same thing. And they all kind of have that, wah, you know, they could hold the mic out about two feet from them and they're still like they're blowing the mic out, you know, so. What was it like to see the first show with, with Robin after knowing Cheap Trick with the previous singer? What, what was that like when you saw Robin added to the mix? Um, well, my first impression was, uh, my first impression was I'd seen a poster of the new singer and uh, he kind of had short hair and uh, and uh, Bunny had already chopped his hair off and was wearing a white shirt and a tie and a vest. And uh, Tom looked uh, uh, exotic and uh, Rick hadn't gone for the uh, sweater, the Mr. Rogers look yet. <clears throat> So I, I, that's how I, I said, wow, the singer's got like short hair and stuff. So it wasn't that long after I, I saw him play and uh, he had this really long hair. I was like, ah, so it made it look like he'd been in a band a while, you know, but I was like, oh, he, they just pulled it back or something. So that was kind of clever, but yeah, he looked great and sounded great. And uh, the other guy was good too that they had before, uh, Zeno, and they kind of looked alike. They was kind of looked like they just switched places, you know, but uh, Robin was a a step or two above that yeah you know he had the charisma and style and wasn't just another rock and roll singer guy that he had something you know yeah that's amazing now i i know um of course just prior to the um the handcuffs like you say you had the um um the elvis brothers you know talk talk about you know morphing into that band and becoming Brad Elvis. And, you know, um, I know you did a couple albums through, uh, I think it was portrait epic. Um, yes. Yeah. T t talk, talk about your best memories of the Elvis brothers. Um, let's see. Elvis was so screams. Uh, we toured, did a bunch of tours and stuff. Uh, went to England on our own, uh, toured headlined a tour there. And while we were there, the label got dropped from MCA. We were on this new label called Infinity. And uh, 
bad name, Infinity, it didn't last. And uh, so we were there in November and about a halfway, two thirds through the tour, we got word that the label was like, the label's gonna be dropped in like a day or two. And we're like, uh, so. Uh, yeah, it was just like flipping the switch, just cutting, yeah. off the, cutting off the money supply. Maybe this should have been called Finite, Finite Records. Yeah, or non-eternal records. Uh, but um, yeah, so I was like the one day we were, we just came off a Van Halen tour and we're now we're at Headline in England, getting great reviews, doing well. We have just been okayed for the second album. Uh, you guys did well enough. You're gonna, you're good for a second album. Oh, great. And, you know, then like days later, it's like, uh huh. Now what do we do? We're back in Champaign, Illinois, you know, twiddling our thumbs going, uh, it was just like everything wiped out. And uh, it was a big deal at the time uh, like in Rolling Stone. Uh, yeah, I remember New a, England was on that label, and the, yeah, the, who else was on the label? Um, Aldo Nova, Cindy Lauper, um, and originally they were off by the time we were on, but uh, 2020, uh, the producers, uh, Spiral Gyra, no, it was Spiral Gyra, no, that was uh, on Infinity. Oh wait, what are we talking about? Infinity now or Portrait? Well, well no, I'm I'm fine with Portrait. I I, I was just saying. Okay. I remember the band New England was on Inf Infinity too. Right. Yeah. I don't yeah, know yeah. if there was any other memorable artist back then. Wasn't uh -huh. it Ron Alexenberg? Was he the? Yeah. Uh huh. And they were all great. They were all nice to us, and it was all good. But it was just MCA, the mothership. Uh, decided to clean yeah, house. More, it, more more money going out than coming in. Somebody. Yeah. It was. It it was the end of that whole 70s Fleetwood Mac. Everybody has their own limo uh, tour support, crazy ads. I just, someone just sent me a, I click, you know, rock and roll memorabilia and things like that. And someone just sent me a, a newspaper uh, ad from the Chicago Tribune uh, from like 19. 76 or 7, 8, somewhere in there. And it was like this big full page ad in the Chicago Tribune. It was an iron on for Fleetwood Mac. It, you know, like it had to cost like so much money. Uh, oh, we want this iron, iron on. Was, was in the newspaper. Yeah, we want this iron on. In the newspaper itself. And it probably, they probably did that all over. You know, it was just like, oh, I got this great idea. People will get this iron on and put it on their t shirts and it'll help advertise Fleetwood Mac, you know. and uh, so it had to cost like a jillion dollars. So those days were over, and um, and it wasn't just our label. A lot of labels and a lot of bands were just wiped out. It was, like I said, it was the end of the 70s thing, and uh, it was 1979, November. And uh, Yeah, it spurred well, a lot of DIY labels, a lot of underground stuff after that, you know? Yep, and uh, so we uh, were victims of that. But we it was kind of good that we actually got to experience some of that cool rock star, almost famous uh, 70s stuff uh, that year before that all happened, you know, with the, like I said, the Van Halen tours and playing with everybody else and uh, playing the big halls and going in limos and things, you know, uh, but that, you know, it was, that's all gone. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well tell us, about the new handcuff single and what you can tell us about the, the the new album what songs you're most proud of and you know after three albums in the can you know what you feel you've uh, accomplished with this fourth one um well we take a lot chloe and i and our good bands that we have been talented uh people and friends in the band uh we've always uh really taken like all, all bands should do this but we really are meticulous about uh our recordings and pick out the best songs and and uh just the production of it all and everything we know what we want and and we know how to get it and uh we're proud of every release that we have uh, we were just talking about that the other day i know it's our own stuff but sometimes you know you you'll have an album in your if you're lucky enough, people, you know, they have a, a history of albums. It's like, yeah, that song, eh, that, that song shouldn't have been on there. 
yeah, the production on that, uh, so whatever, you know. But uh, we feel that we put on anything, even from our first album, second album, we're like, yep, good song, sounds good, sounds, it could still be played today, it sounds, it still sounds current, it doesn't sound dated, uh, and uh, all that sort of stuff. So we've evolved, and now, uh, the, and each one kind of has a theme of some sort, but uh, the new album, we really wanted to, uh, am I too loud? Am I shouting? I don't think I'm shouting, right? No, no you're good. I, I don't want to blow anything out. Yeah, I feel like I'm not. like, ah! And um, uh, the fourth album, we really wanted to capture that, uh, you know, as you can see behind me, there's walls of records back there. Ding dong. Yeah, digging through the crates. And, um, so we listened to a lot of vinyl and all that and you know we of course we love a lot of everything but uh that late very late 60s early 70s those classic great rock albums you know and anything from beggar's banquet to who's next to, uh Martha Hoople, all those warm sounding great rock albums that you could put on now and you're going like, yeah you know this is what it's about this is what you know this is, sounds like rock music this is great I, I miss those days you know so we decided let's write songs and put an album together uh, like that and uh, that sort of thing almost like it was a lost uh album from that era and uh we'd a beat a lot of stuff go you know led zeppelin early albums that were like oh yeah oh yeah they don't even have when it goes to lead solo there they don't have a rhythm guitar underneath of it get that out of there you know we're like so we were like stripping it down and just really man that bass is so warm it's great and uh what do they do for the background for all those background vocals so uh, it's really sparse and so anyway that's what the new album is about and we really worked on the songs and the production and um uh, it's getting uh the new single our first single the album's not out yet which will be called burn the rails and uh, the new single is Love Me While You Can. And uh, it's out now digitally. And uh, it kind of has that uh, kind of uh, Nicky Hopkins playing with the Stones on Beggar's Banquet meets, uh, you know, Moth the Hoople. And, uh, but all seen through kind of a modern lens of some sort. And uh, anybody that heard it so far, they're like, this sounds great. That I love the song and that. So that was a relief, you know. Didn't want to have one of those things. You're like, I don't get it. So people are getting it, and it's just the first single. And uh, the next, we're going to do another single after this, and then we're going to do the album, and that will be in vinyl and download and CD and eight track, seventy eight cassette. No, it's kidding. All that sort of stuff. And, uh, and Burn the Rails, that, that title came from uh, here in Chicago when it gets like zero degrees, no degrees and, and below when it gets just like bitter, like it's, which is not, doesn't happen that often, but you know, it's going to be 20 below zero, you know, that does happen. They, uh, the railroad tracks, they actually uh, set them alight, they set them on fire and, to keep the tracks from expanding or something like that. and. I just discovered that a few years ago when that actually happened, and I saw the photos. And I, so, so what, do they pour so, some flammable material on them and then light them I on? think, yeah, or they have like little wood piles or something under, it's like weird, and it's such a weird visual, like you see like in the dark or whatever, these railroad tracks, like a number of railroad, and they're like have fire on them, you know, it's kind of bizarre, and uh, it's called Burning the Rails, and uh, we thought that was a cool title and a, a Chicago connection, and uh, sounds like something, you know, Mott the Hoople would have under their lyrics, you know, burn the rails all the way to Memphis or whatever, and uh, so uh, we added that to one of our songs, and uh, that's the title. That's the story of the title. Wow. No, we can't wait for that. We We look forward to turning everybody on to the new handcuffs. You got to go and check out all of their stuff it's the website is thehandcuffs.com and you know get ready there'll be four albums in the can get your vinyl and um spread spread the word man it's a it's a great sound that you have and 
and I know you've been keeping that beat in our boys, the romantics, you know, Wally and Mike and Rich and everybody, you know, yeah. it's, uh, it's a monster sound. I, I was an early promoter of, of theirs and we helped oh, them good. go from the clubs to the Hollywood Palladium, you know, oh, wow. talking in your nice. sleep. It was a very, a very great night seeing the boys uh, sell out the Palladium. But um, I yeah, can imagine. You know, yeah, oh. that, that sound never goes away, you know, that big beat. And like you say, being a fan of the, the Keith Moons and the Zach Starkeys and the R Ringo Starkey, you know, all, all the greats, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a monster, monster sound, and we love it. Our special guest is Brent, Brad Elvis. Check out thehandcuffs.com. Oh, and uh, if I may throw in real quick, yes. which I forgot because it's new to us, we're uh, our, the, new hand, uh, the Handcuffed album. It's on, we're on a new label called Color Red. And uh, so you can find stuff on Color Red as well. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and they'll they'll that website. They'll direct you to, you know, where to get the single and albums and information on us and all that. Uh, so Color Red. Okay, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but I was like, oh, I forgot. <laughs> oh, thehandcuffs.com, on Color Red. Check them out, and as you dig into the vaults, get back to the Elvis Brothers, and of course, you know, the romantic stuff, and all the way to Screams. 17 that, years next month. Th that's incredible. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>